Welcome to another episode of the Coffee Roaster Warm Sessions podcast. Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, my name is Mark Kotrovsky. I'm here with Sergi Kotrovsky. We're both founders of, uh, co-founders of Mir Coffee Roasters um, and going almost four years strong. Almost. It felt like forever starting off. You're like, oh man, when are we going to hit four years? Is it? Is this the month Almost. when we got our business license? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Four years ago? Yeah, yeah. yeah. And we then, weren't up and running, yeah, but we got our business yeah, yeah. license. And then November was the first roast. It was like right. a, Thanksgiving like Day. Like the turkey bowl, but yeah. it was a turkey roast. <laughs> turkey Serge, roast. have you taken part in the turkey bowl? Uh, like the done? football game? Yeah, yeah. Like, have you ever had like a turkey bowl with like friends? Oh, you're talking about like a backyard shenanigans yeah, yeah, kind yeah. of game. Yeah, 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 of course, of course. Uh, there's also, I think, the turkey bowl is like the college <laughs> football game, something like that. Yeah, yeah, for sure. <laughs> that, yeah. Just the names, like iconic. Like, I think it's such a, I don't know, that something about that staple. It's, it's phenomenal. Uh, also, also, <laughs> there's a very big difference between like football culture and Thanksgiving culture in the North Mm -hmm. and in the South. So because I've lived in like, you know, Tennessee, Alabama, um, Florida, like that, that moment, that day, the pre and post nap football is iconic. I have not seen or heard of anyone doing something like that in this part of the United States. Am I wrong? Uh, I, I I don't know. I'm not like insanely into sports, so I wouldn't know. What do you mean you're not? You played football all of all I mean, of high I school. Mean, I mean, play, I played a lot of sports in high school, but I'm not like, I don't watch. Yeah, you were like I a state running back. Wa- what are no, you talking no, about? No, no, that's not true. So yeah, just, you yeah. always say this. This is not true. <laughs> all righty. Mark well, was like watching tape, no. like Mark Ingram's <laughs> tape, like nobody's business. It's not true. Yeah. Um Broke my broke one bone in my body and it's this one right here. Yeah, this and that cost you state. <laughs> no, no, not true. Where'd y'all go? I mean, no, okay, dude, whatever. No, not, whatever. Not, not, not close. Okay. All right. Well, we have a loaded conversation today. It's gonna be a little two parter. Um, we're gonna talk about how baristas or how people in the industry, but mostly probably baristas, even though these things can probably um, work for anybody in the industry. How do you maximize? your worth and how much you get paid in the industry and how do you how do you make some damage in the industry but also uh next week we'll talk about more how can business owners in the coffee industry pay uh pay people better because that's a very real problem not just at the farm level but as uh yeah as just owners everywhere so but let's pour some batches we always do and the smell of these beans, ground and whole. Beans, beans, beans. beans. <laughs> it's phenomenal. Ooh. Oh, man. Woo. Just the smells is mouth-watering. Man. This is on the top tier of coffee experiences I've had in a while. Oh, really? Mm-hmm. The ex- not the flavor, but the drinking experience of this batch brew really reminded me of the initial drinking experience of the Diego Bruno. hundred percent. As soon as different you coffee, said that, different I said everything, but the experience the same. hundred percent. hundred percent. And I, I, I think, to be honest, this might be, okay, maybe, maybe not. I, I have a soft spot for Diego's thermal roasted by Manhattan, but this is, I'd say on par. I, I think this is on par. This is yeah. very, very tasty. This is bonkers. Yeah. I mean, this is a, a beautiful coffee. Absolutely incredible. Fantastic. Maybe could have gone a little finer. It's a little, mm-hmm. a little, not watery, but like yeah, it's slightly it's, weak. It's, it's slightly weak. Yeah. Slight sourness, just slight, but overall, it's still very pleasing, mm-hmm. very pleasing, and still punches through. Um, what are you getting on the on your taste? Uh, pink lemonade, very very quick. The sweetest pink lemonade you can imagine. I mean, pineapple too, like tropical fruit. Lots of tropical fruit. Yeah. 
the sweetness is very incredible. Um, don't take this as a negative connotation. I think this is very positive, but there's a little bit of green tea on it or oolong tea. Oolong That's tea? very yes, tasty. Oolong tea. Um, very tasty. Yes. yes, oolong tea. Yeah, yeah. Mm. This is, I mean, lots of fruit, tropical fruit. Um, I mean, might be bold. I mean, pineapple, yeah. Um, maybe not mango, but... But there's that like rich fruit sweetness. It's phenomenal. I mean, the balance on it is great. The mm. I think the roast on it is pretty oh, decent. Absolutely incredible. I mean, the the coffee. And this is a uh, friends. I just came back from Europe, and uh, stopped by in Zurich, uh, Switzerland. Stopped by. I don't even know how to how to pronounce them. Um, ma- Mame. Mame. Mom. Mame. I don't know. It's M A M E. Yeah. Um, they have this cool, interesting packaging. I know some of you who are followers of ours um, actually have recommended this to me. Oh, nice. And I didn't know until actually Scott Rayo told me that I should stop by. Um, but this is a uh, Colombian pink bourbon washed in aerobic. Um, yeah. Farmer Julio. Uh, Caesar Madrid, uh, Farm La Riviera, uh, f- notes of peach, Earl Grey, Agua Panela. Okay. I don't know what gotcha. Agua Panela is. That sounds familiar, but peach f- makes sense. I, not not panela, as much Earl like Grey. Sweet sweet water. What does Panela mean? That's such a familiar Spanish know. word that I know. I mean, I'm, we all I'm, know I'm what gonna, Agua means, I'm right? Gonna, like, <laughs> I'm gonna. Yeah. Uh, I guess Earl Grey makes sense because I was kind of. Picking up that uh, oolong tea, but maybe Earl Grey makes sense to me. Maybe not. Okay. Peach, I guess. So it's a. Uh, so it's Panella wa- It says, pan- I mean, um, is a drink commonly found in South America. Well, it's made made with sugar cane, mm-hmm. and it can be served cold or warm. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So sugar water. Yeah, sugar cane drink. Yeah. I mean, that's the lemonade part. That's why, like, for me, it was, like, an intense oh, wow. pink lemonade. Peach kind of makes sense. I'm still kind of, like, puzzled about that one. Like, is that is that what I'm tasting? Or maybe, I don't know. I mean, I, I would 10 out of 10 recommend this to anybody. Yeah. This is freaking out, outrageous. So, yeah. On on the top tier of this year that I've had in coffees. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Dang, dude. And this is the pink bourbon. I mean, I would consider... Well, this coffee is right about two weeks off a of roast. Yeah. Like 20 days. No. Yeah, like 18 days. Nice. Tasty. I need, I need to drink this like a couple times a day so I finish it all while it's tasting like this. Because this is phenomenal. Um, so, yeah. Wow. What a delightful what a delightful surprise and experience. But, um, yeah. Alrighty. So, we wanted to talk about... Um, how do we, how do we, um, I, 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 this was birth out of the idea of, Hey, um, people in the industry are already getting not, I will, and oftentimes yes, underpaid, but also not getting paid, you know, a livable wage or maybe just livable, but it's very few are getting lavish pays you know Mm -hmm. and that's Mm -hmm. not to say that we we should be necessarily um but i think there's definitely a big issue in getting paid enough and so we are talking about it back and forth literally just before the pod and then i just realized like man we can actually make this a two-part episode because i don't think there's a clear answer to this that is either blaming well maybe not blaming but pointing the responsibility Mm -hmm. at one or the other like we can't just say all cafe owners are bad because they're not paying their baristas yeah. well enough well sure there are bad owners but that doesn't mean all of them um and we also can't say hey owners just pay your baristas more duh yeah. well that's not always feasible and so what came to mind was like realizing that hey there's actually this is actually a problem that i think both sides need to work together on and how do we how do we work together as a team to be able to make uh this possible for mm-hmm. people to get paid and enjoy what they do um 
and yeah, I don't know. Yeah, there's a lot of things at play for sure, uh, especially part of the solution and the problem is you know consumer habits. We talked a little bit about that um, cultural. Uh, like stigma towards these entry level kind of jobs. That's mm-hmm. a big one. Um, but also I think the big, one of the biggest, uh, biggest things to consider is expectations. When you go and apply at a cafe, um, why are you applying? Like, what are you looking for? Um, where are you in life? Like, are you trying to figure out what you want to do for life? Have you figured out, is this a career change? So those, those elements and those stages in life will play a very big role in what you bring to the table because part of what you mentioned in the beginning is how much value can you bring Mm -hmm. and how is your uh, maybe talent your expertise your trade that -hmm. you're bringing to the table um, is going to be valued at the company that you bring it so those are very big variables what big variables when a business owner or when even a general manager is hiring because mm-hmm. I, know, I know for myself when i'm hiring people i am looking at resumes mm-hmm. i am looking at experience i am processing that and there's not like right or wrong answer within that i'm not saying i only hire people with bachelor degrees like i don't do that right and i also don't hire and i not not hire people with like i don't specifically target people with no experience Mm -hmm. and there are certain elements within the coffee industry that some owners and some general managers will hire people with certain you know levels of experience Mm -hmm. and then will not hire people with certain level of experience one of the obvious ones you probably heard this is like oh sometimes it's easier to hire someone with no experience yeah um so those those are all elements that kind of define the starting wage Mm -hmm. but then going on from there there's a lot more going on for sure um you know that that just that was very triggering to hear (laughs) because uh let's just say very much so back in the day when i was uh maybe i was maybe like 20 um i was looking for a job and i wanted a cafe job because i had just moved back from portland and I was like, man, I want to get a job because I just had this coffee in line. I want to learn. When I, and man, nobody wanted to hire me. McDonald's didn't even hire me. <laughs> yeah, this is real. I applied at Starbucks. They didn't I, hire me. I applied literally everywhere. Not, McDonald's, DQ, Wendy's, nobody wanted me at all. And I finally got one job, which is the summer temporary job, um, which was at Lowe's. Uh, and they paid me actually like four or five, four dollars over a minimum wage. Whoa. And I was like pushing carts and I'm like, hell yeah, dude, are you kidding <laughs> That's me? That's fun. So, but, but though it was very frustrating though, to being like, man, I want to work in the industry, but I have no experience. And mm-hmm. most of the places said, Hey, you need at least a year or two of experience behind bar. And I'm like, are you kidding me? How do I get this experience? If I've never had, if everybody's asking for experience, how do I get experience in the first place? You know, mm-hmm. but that being said, um, what are you, what are you looking for from people who are applying, say, even like me, who maybe has zero experience or maybe a little bit of experience? What are the things that you're keeping an eye out for? Um, uh, I, one of the fir- first things I remember is, uh, a friend of mine back in the day, uh, Paul Carr in Florida. Um, he used to, I think either manage bold bean or whatever. He played some significant role at bold bean. And he mentioned one of the one of the ways that he hires is he literally looks for people that he would be interested in hanging out with. Mm-hmm. And I think that's kind of profound. That may not be like a perfect definition, but that speaks a lot about culture, personality, and hospitality. Mm-hmm. Because I think I, I, I can firmly say that coffee skills can be taught, but personality traits or um, hospitality skills have to be caught so there's this big difference in the sense of i can tell you logistically like how to tamp proper how to steam milk how to do a pour over you might be good at it you might not be like unreal or excellent about it or have all the ideas but you will do good enough to be able to work behind the bar but when it comes to like social skills that's like if you, if you're a socially awkward person and you don't like talking to people, mm-hmm. that's not something I can force you to do or teach you to do. I can give you tips and all of that, but you can't, you know. So those are kind of the main things. But again, me saying all of that, 
paints the picture that getting a job as a barista or getting a job in a cafe has a very low barrier to entry. Mm -hmm. Interesting. I think uh, as you know, something I've something I've noticed is oftentimes people actually hire people like themselves. That's also um, scary. It's 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 scary. Yeah, yeah. It, it is definitely scary. But that that's what made me think when you said. He said that uh, he hired hire somebody yeah. that he. That, that's not exactly himself. what I mean, and maybe that's right, my right, personality. Right. Yeah, and I don't. And yeah. I'm not saying that that's bad. Yeah. But um, ever since I started to pick up on that, I started to notice that actually in a lot of workplaces, people find yeah. to hire people kind of like themselves, which can be uh, good and bad. Um, I think good in the sense of well then there's some kind of culture in place right. that is a little easier to develop because, mm -hmm. you know, you guys are similar. But I think the the bad thing about that is also is that, you know, as a business owner, you can only grow, uh, like the cap is your actually understanding yeah. of how to build a business. And so if everybody's like you, similar to you, and uh, there's just not enough... Be, I, in some ways, diversity is actually beneficial because it adds a hundred percent. It adds actually a lot of nuance and skills and thought and ideas and creativity that you, as the sole owner or the jet, the man, the main manager, might not actually have. So there's actually some benefit in hiring people that are slightly maybe have like a like an interesting edge to them. Yeah. Which brings me to this point is that um, that there's it might be. It might be good to not always neglect the skills that you have as a person applying for a cafe yes. that might not be 100% direct to uh, pulling a shot of espresso. Exactly. Like it's it may not be the best thing. Like reframing yourself to think like, you know, if you're like writing down your experience or if somebody asks, hey, do you have any coffee experience on your interview? And you're like, well, I used to pull shots here and there or, hey, I, I make my coffee every morning. I, that sounds stupid to say, but I, this is just an example. It might actually be smarter and more beneficial for you and for your manager to say, hmm, well, I have a lot of really great people skills. I used to lead a group of, you know, teenagers, um, at, you know, during their basketball camp you know, a few years ago, you mm -hmm. know what I mean? That might actually be a little more beneficial than saying, Oh, I, I, I worked at a cafe at a drive through for a few months. Does that, am I, am I oh, no, a hundred percent. Because for me, when I'm interviewing someone, yeah. when I'm asking questions, one of the most important questions is equally as important is the question. What were your top five favorite movies of all time? That's one. <laughs> and then it will stand head to head with a very, crucial question is how well do you work with the team mm -hmm. how well do you follow directions describe mm -hmm. good work ethic and the reason is there is this uh not balance not the right word but there is this equal um form of value when i'm looking for someone and that's like mm -hmm. do you have like personality and culture right mm -hmm. and do you also have these abilities that you are a person that's able to like co-create with a team and make something happen not you and only your skills individually but how your skills fit in with the team so there is that give uh not give and takes not the right word but there is that cohesiveness that i'm mm -hmm. looking for in a person that works in different facets of the role that they're about to take what do you think if somebody was like dude i hate movies oh that's fine okay i mean m maybe i won't drive then you do you like music like, what are your top favorite <laughs> artists? Um, uh, I, poetry. Like, what? Who? Who's your favorite poet? Um, I, philosophy. Like, I'm, what? I, you know? Yeah, what I, mean? I, yeah. I only say. I only if someone say, said I, I only don't like movies, that, I would struggle. Yeah. I only say that because I literally I hate movies, well, with the exception of like a handful. No, I and would so, know what you would and say. And so I was like, no. I was like, say hmm, Twilight. No. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, the first Spider Man. Yeah, yeah, yeah like, exactly. Oh, this is a Tobey yeah. Maguire yeah. kind of guy. <laughs> <laughs> you, you, this is dangerous ground right here. Um, yeah. But then well, he's like, well, I'm also a cinematographer, and I'm like, oh, interesting. Perk up a little. <laughs> Interesting. Yeah. yeah, you sound like the perfect person to be extremely highly critical yeah. of everything we do <laughs> and think you're always the best way. Uh, anyways, uh, yeah, I, th I, I think it's very, very important to bring value to the table to the team that might not. 
and again again this might actually fit more with our episode next week from a business owner of being able to find top tier talent but not only should the business owner should be looking for top tier talent i think presenting yourself as top tier talent yeah is important like again not neglecting some of the very powerful skills that you have that could be completely unrelated to to coffee i think it would be you know interesting to be like oh yeah i also managed some social media back yeah you know a few years ago like having that asset i think would be so important like for me personally if i was hiring that i'd like perk up i'd be like wait a second so not only can you pull some shots but maybe we can have some time allotted to you just to manage socials i i dig into that a little bit Mm -hmm. and maybe ask some more you know learning learning questions to figure out where you're at you know but a lot of the there's i'm just bringing up a few but there's a lot of skills yeah because at the end of the day at the end of the day as somebody who's working for somebody else the biggest thing is you need to be able to bring value to the company and you are essential to the growth of the business mm-hmm. like 100 at, at the end of the day i mean that's both depressing but also very encouraging because mm-hmm. number one if you don't bring value and you're not making the business more money then you might be considered for you know getting laid off yeah. which i i think that's that kind of makes sense and i think that's not necessarily a bad thing but number two is realizing wait if you do bring value no you are essential to your workplace you're not just another thing and hopefully again this is for next week but hopefully your manager doesn't treat you like another thing mm-hmm. that that just keeps the ball spinning but literally you are essential to the growth of the company and everything that you offer uh is essential to literally making this thing move forward and advance to whatever goals your manager has in place and yeah i think i I think um you bring a specific set of experiences and skills and you shouldn't shy away from that yeah when i applied for my first coffee job I actually I actually did not apply for the role that I got the job for. I wanted an entry level barista job and I ended up snagging the management job, my first coffee job. I've never pulled a shot of espresso. I made I have never made coffee for someone that paid me to make coffee. Yeah. It was only free pour overs on the road. But I remember the owners, uh, Marcy and Matt, responded uh to in my interview was what they saw in my resume was my ability to manage teams and finances because I gave up a 10 year career that I developed in order to go into an entry level coffee job. Mm -hmm. So I had a lot on the line. Like I could have continued growing my career. I would have been in a way different place in life Mm -hmm. right now, but I chose to give that up to pursue coffee. And the transition was very intimidating for me. But what the owner saw was the fact that I brought other things to the table other than my inability. And I think one of those that if you're applying for a coffee job and you're looking to make a sustainable wage as a uh, coffee professional, one of the things you should probably have high up there on um, your list is setting expectations for yourself why are you getting this job again? Mm-hmm. Where is your long-term goal for this job and or for this uh, kind of move into this career? And then the same thing is with your employer. One of the things I told Marcy and Matt was if I'm taking this job, I didn't know that I w- it was going to be management, but mm-hmm. if I take the role at Sippers, I said that a requirement for me would be to sit in on a roast and watch mm-hmm. the roaster roast. Why? Because I already had a plan. I had an idea. Mirror was already kind of birthed in me back then Mm -hmm. to know that if I wanted to achieve something or start something Mm -hmm. like Mirror, if I wanted to um, help find a business or be one of the co-founders of a company or one of the co-owners of a company, Mm -hmm. I had to plan for that from the day I applied for my first barista job. So what I made as Sippers maybe it wasn't fully a full-blown livable wage. Mm-hmm. I, I got by, I made it, I'm here, mm-hmm. right? But the reality is my focus wasn't the wage that I got when I got hired. My focus was the future of building Mirror. Mm-hmm. So I had to go in with that expectation. For me, 
And then I also asked the owners, hey, can I sit in on a roast? Can I do this monthly? You know, 100%. I think I'm glad I'm glad you went there because, yeah, I think a lot of the, you know, for most of this podcast, we're talking about how do you get in, get your foot into the door. But then there's the other side is how do you maximize? Because sometimes getting your foot in the door is literally just to get your foot in the door. Mm hmm. There's there it, there there won't be very much expectation for that. However, to get your foot in the door, like the win there is that you got your foot in the door. Yeah, that's the win. And then you need to figure out how do you inch that door, you know, s- squeeze through there for for bigger and more opportunities. I think, um, yeah, having a plan, a goal in mind for where you want to be. But I I'm gonna piggyback off of the concept of like being willing to learn. Mm-hmm. and be curious like you have to be you have to be willing to to learn to grow to try new things to be somewhat ambitious somewhat driven to be like man i want i want to i want to um grow in in coffee and the way you do that i think is literally by learning new skills so coming with the skills that you have but also being able to learn new skills um adapt to different situations be curious ask questions i guarantee you if you ask your manager or your head roaster maybe you work at a roastery just clarifying questions or maybe hey can i just like come in on my free time and just learn from you can i just ask some like i any decent manager or owner is going to appreciate that so much and guess what in return you get the skills that will actually help you take on your next job whether it's in the same company or even if it's a cafe down the street that's looking for somebody with those specifications it's going to pay more it's going to give you more opportunities like you have the leverage now the leverage is in your experience the leverage is in your knowledge your skills and you can actually build that once you have your foot in the door yeah and pair that with just hard work and commitment it's going to go a long way 100 percent. because it doesn't require much skill to be able to clean a bathroom well to take out all the trashes to make sure that those trash bags are tied and not just thrown on there and then they fall in like those mm-hmm. little things are noticed by managers so let's say you got your foot in the door you're looking to you know grow this as a career you're looking to get paid more you can just do a very, very good job with the skills and with the role that you were given and you will see growth almost all the time. Like that, I don't want to say, uh, use blanket statements, mm-hmm. but hard work goes so far because as managers, as owners, we see the value that you're bringing to the team when it closes good and a manager or another employee comes in the morning and they just have a swell of a morning opening up and they don't have to like put out any fires or clean up any yes. messes. That makes such a fun and good working experience. And that is gonna, you know, go far. And then little skills like some of the baristas that the entry level jobs that I gave to baristas and watch them just pay high attention to detail, like cups or organ little things that I no longer have to worry about as a manager. I I'm looking to promote people like that, you know, because they bring so much value to me. They give me peace of mind, but then they also like make the business so much more prosperous. Trying not to overlap on the episode of next week, which we'll, we'll talk more about, but um, yeah, I think a lot of those things do not go unnoticed. If you have a decent manager, like a decent, and if you're a bad manager and you're listening to this, listen, get your act together. <laughs> but you know, like if you have a decent manager, those things do not go unnoticed. And once again, yeah, uh, before I go there, but yeah. I, I will say this is that if you crush it in the little things, listen, you're, you'll be put over some bigger things. That's yep. it. That's That's just how things work, I think. And maybe it's not in your current job, but man, if you can, if you want to go work for somewhere else, leaving a good taste in your mouth in your previous manager is always a win. Always. Yeah. There's nothing like having a really good recommendation. uh, What do they call um, a reference from Mm -hmm. a past manager that just says, damn i wish we'd never let go of this person yeah that is huge but also going forward when you have a good opportunity or when you have a good relationship with your manager imagine if you're 
had a great relationship with your cafe manager, but then also you went and started a roasting company. Mm -hmm. That is huge. That's huge. Or imagine if you went and started working for a green coffee importer and then now you could turn around and send an email to an old manager that you had a good relationship with and you're trying to broker some green. Mm -hmm. Those things, you guys, don't go so far because that trust is built and trust is so huge. If you can just show, man, you're on top of things and you're doing things right and you're, you have that attention to detail, you're a hard worker, man, those are the people that I'm looking for. Yeah, and part of this dialogue, I think we all need to redefine what um, what's the wage that we're looking to get paid because mm-hmm. part of the you know part of the things that we're getting out of this job is one the economic, the financial, the per hour money that we're getting, right? That's one thing. The other side of it is what life currencies are you receiving? You know, you have a set of values as a human and are you getting paid those life currencies? If you value like, oh, you know, I need peace of mind. I need security. Mm -hmm. Does this job bring that? And Mm -hmm. I think those things are such a, there's such a bigger return and such a higher pay if you're in the right place for the right reasons that whether if you're getting paid and I I don't, I don't know how many, how much cafes are getting paid. Like I know what we pay and what I've, I've experienced Mm -hmm. a lot of the times those wages are livable. You may not be like you said in the beginning, like having this abundant, you know, paycheck where you're able to buy, you know, two or three houses and, you know, maybe, you know, a Toyota Supra, I don't know what cars you're into. You know what I mean? It might not be those wages, but you still can get a wage that you can kind of build a life with. You can potentially, if you stay for a long time, buy a house with those wages. Like there is the, there are those possibilities out there, but I think you have to pair that with the ideas of those life currencies. Like what do you need as a person? Mm -hmm. And does this job provide that? For sure, one hundred percent. That is, that is very, very valid because those things are also not worth overlooking for the mm-hmm. sake of, you know, just getting just getting paid more or whatever it is. It just it's like a it just goes back to like climbing the corporate ladder. Yeah, and that's not that's not the, that's not the point here. But I think there's a lot of value in providing lots of value. Like there's a lot of value in being a very valuable asset to, you know your manager, your coworkers, but also your community. Listen, like a really spectacular barista, there's few things to compare. Listen, like I, I I know people who go to cafes and are like, man, when he or she is working, it's like the best thing ever. Mm-hmm. I know my beverage is going to be tasty. I know I'm going to be served well. I know I'm going to be taken care of. Like, Literally, like not only not only are you getting the benefit out of doing good, but also now you're literally reflecting good to the community. Mm-hmm. And that actually goes even further. Like we're talking like really big picture now because now you're building relationships with people outside of the industry and you're leaving a really good trace behind you. And friends, a good reputation is... Is, is very, very, very useful yeah. <laughs> when the time comes. So. Yeah. I mean, I, I, I was sitting doing some admin work the other day when you and Matt were sitting next to me. Uh, I don't know if you met the other fellow that was sitting. I kind of built a, a connection with him. Um, he's, he became a regular. He's out of town but comes to Bellingham on and off. And after y'all left, a few other people came in. My friend June from uh, Vancouver, BC, came in. Nice. And after a while, that guy sits there he's like, you're you're like the mayor of the town like <laughs> yeah. and um it, it it was it was funny for me to hear it was also kind of encouraging for me to hear yeah. but you're right like as a barista and as someone who works in a cafe you get to build these relationships and those relationships are priceless mm-hmm. like, and you know no one can put a price tag on those connections and those relationships because even like today on my story when i posted that video where you know chris my buddy was out sitting and playing the guitar mm-hmm. What I experienced in that moment was just so much love and peace. Like Trey brought me a drink. I saw my buddy Chris, a regular. 
um, sit there and play guitar and the connections, all of that is so priceless for me. But then take that into monetary value. You know, I'm shooting a wedding with Silas today. How did I meet Silas? I was his barista at Makeworth. Yeah. And now, you know, he still comes into narrative. We're still friends. He's also now one of my partners I shoot with weddings and I make even more money out there. So you got to think outside of the box of just a, how much am I getting paid per hour? Mm -hmm. Again, I want to put that in context of this whole episode. I'm not saying you should sacrifice getting paid uh, getting a good wage. That's not that's yes. not what I'm talking about. But I'm saying put it in context of everything else you're getting out of yes. this job and then ask yourself the question, am I getting paid a living wage? Yes. And am I getting paid enough? Yeah, 100%. 100%. There's so many facets to this. But friends, hopefully, you know, hopefully you're a barista that was encouraged, that was inspired. Um, I know it can be very monotone and you going through the motions, okay? Maybe you're listening to this, and you're like, "All right, I gotta, I gotta open up tomorrow morning." And yeah, okay, you know, working on the weekend again. Like, I get it. And there's, man, no, this isn't meant to push somebody down, discourage anybody. I get it. I've been there. I've worked very little bit before behind the bar, but they were definitely not every day was great, spectacular. But hopefully, this was encouraging and it was like gave you a little more you know, juice in the system that was like, mm-hmm. dude, hell yeah, we, we, we have some direction. We can do this, you know, gave you some ideas. So thank you so much for listening to another episode of the Coffee Roaster Warm Sessions podcast. Friends, this was such a delightful episode. Share this with somebody who works in the industry. But as we always say, remember, reflect what's good.